Escaped Sapiens. When will we colonize Mars? How will we do it? And what are the benefits? In this episode of the Escaped Sapiens podcast, I speak with Robert Zubrin, who is an aerospace engineer, author, and founder of the Mars Society, an international organization advocating for the human colonization of Mars. Robert is a co-author of Mars Direct, a proposed blueprint for Mars colonization intended to significantly reduce the cost and complexity of such a mission while staying within the bounds of current technology. In our conversation, Robert offers a fascinating glimpse into an interplanetary future that might one day, very soon, become a reality. I hope you enjoy hearing what he has to say. Do you remember the first moon landing? Or do you remember where yes, you were? Certainly. Where, where were you? Do, do you, do you remember? I was in Leningrad uh, the, uh, during the moon landing. Um, I was 17. I was a competitive chess player. I was in the Soviet Union uh, to learn Russian so I could read the Soviet chess texts. And yes, I saw the uh, moon landing on a Russian television. Uh, and the, um, um, but what was more interesting was the re action of the Russians, um, which was, th they were enthusiastic, it, the ones I was dealing with. So there was no animosity? We, no, no, it was Maladets. It was, you know, do you know the cosmonauts? The, 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 the um, um, no, we had excelled in a sport that they could appreciate. Now, I'm sure they would have been uh, vastly more enthusiastic and happy if it had been uh, uh, Russians who had done it. But still, um, th they thought it was great. Uh, and so, you know, I, I could tell you, you know, from being over there that we, we did... Uh, you know, Kennedy wanted to astonish the world with what free people could do, and he made an impression uh, because the belief that humanity should expand into the cosmos was uh, fairly widely held uh, in the Soviet Union, and um, and we were doing it. Was that feeling uh, on the ground? Is that what initially got you interested in space exploration? No, or was uh, this... it was an earlier episode involving the Soviets called uh, Sputnik. Uh, I was um, five when Sputnik flew, and it, it's actually the first you know world event that I can remember in terms of my personal experience. And while the adults may have been you know terrified of Sputnik because it meant the Soviets could hit us with missiles. To me, as a kid, this was terrific because I was already reading science fiction and what Sputnik and then the Sputnik 2 with Laika in it uh, said to me was, was that these stories about the space traveling future that I was reading were going to be real. And so I wanted to be part of it. So in fact, I, I date my... Um, enthusiasm for uh, space to uh, Sputnik. And so Gagarin was a hero. He wasn't the opposite. Well, Gagarin was, of course, was later. It was uh, 1961. Uh, Sputnik mm. was in 57. Um, mm. But um, but sure, uh, Gagarin was great. Uh, and uh, I didn't have a problem with that um, <laughs> at all. Um, you know, th there were many of us already. I mean, when Gagarin flew, I was nine by then. Uh, the, the, you know, wondering, you know, why the U.S. was lagging, but um, there wasn't a sense, at least I didn't have a sense, and and, uh, uh, and other space enthusiasts, kids that I was associating with, did not have a sense that this was a menace to us. This was a great adventure. So uh, do, you th do you think if the Russians had beaten the states to the moon, that uh, the feeling would have been the same on the ground if, if you had been, you know, in Colorado or in New York City? Well, there would have been disappointment that we hadn't been first. Um, yeah. But the still, th this was an adventure. The, 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 you know, the Soviets sent the first probe behind the moon and got the first photographs of the far side of the moon. Um, you know, they did the first uh, two-person uh, flight in space, as well as the first one person flight, they, the first woman in space, um, the the uh, first dog in space, um, and the first dog to come back from space alive, Strelka, 
and in fact, I have a dog named Strelka. Uh, the um, it means little arrow, but the 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 um, uh, you know, uh, but and, and they they sent the first probe to Venus. They also sent the first probe to Mars, but it wasn't successful. The 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 um, uh, but no, there was a sense at the time of 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 a great adventure, and uh, you know, and and that's why it was a natural. I mean, even during the Cold War, uh, you know, Apollo Soyuz mission. Of course, that's 1975 now, but still very much the Cold War. That this was an area in which we could collaborate. Uh, it, it is interesting, uh, Americans and Russians, for different reasons, have a kind of a special uh, attraction to space. Um, the for Americans, um, it, it is uh, frontierism. Mm -hmm. uh, the belief that there, there needs to be an open frontier and that space is the new frontier. There needs to be a place beyond which the rules haven't been written yet. So this is this is very much in, in our psyche and, and it's why, you know, Europe has an economy and a population somewhat larger than the United States. Our space program is five times their size. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what what are the what is it for the Russians then? Well the Russians are a little different. Um is actually a, a strand of, of Russian philosophy called cosmism. Okay. Not communism, cosmism. Uh, and uh, it's been around for somewhat over a century. Well, in fact, Tsiolkovsky was a cosmist. Um, but the, uh, uh, during the Russian Revolution, there was actually a splinter faction uh, whose slogan was, we demand the right to live forever and travel freely throughout the cosmos. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> great bumper sticker, right? The, uh, <laughs> um, but th there is this kind of philosophy, this, this uh, cosmist idea. Um, so it, it, it's not exactly the same, but, well, it's not the same at all, but nevertheless, um, I, I think that's a reason why this was an area in which the Russians, uh, chose to excel. And, you know, of course, in the Soviet Union, there were a lot of fake celebrations, you know, that were staged. But if you want to see a real genuine celebration where the people were really going crazy, it's when Gagarin landed and you see the people, men grabbing him and throwing him into the air. Uh, the, um, I mean, they, they were wild with delight. Did um, you see any of the parades when you were in Leningrad? Were there parades coming through? No, there were no parades at the time I was in Leningrad. Uh, mm -hmm. but, um, but, but you can... Uh, and, 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 and of course, I was in Leningrad in 69, Gagarin flew in 61. But the, the, uh, but, but it, you can see video of, of the, the, the reception of Gagarin uh, uh, that he got, and the crowd really went wild, okay? But the, um, and that was genuine. Um, but sure, um, you know, there's a variety of different cultural stereotypes of Americans and uh, some are uncomplimentary like you know anti-intellectual some are two-sided the cowboy uh, but the one that is uh, positive the positive stereotype of America is uh, the American inventor uh, mm -hmm. and, and it goes back to Benjamin Franklin and Edison and the Wright brothers, and, you know, the moon landing was part of that, you know. I mean, it's why Jules Verne, when he sent people to the moon, had Americans do it in in his book, right? In fact, they launched from Florida. Uh, Which is actually and, pretty incredible, given when Jules Verne was writing. I hadn't appreciated that, actually. Yeah. No, but it was already apparent by uh, 1865, which is when that book was written, mm -hmm. that America was the country of invention. Um, and the, uh, we were a country of gadgeteers and inventors, uh, you know, this kind of thing, that this was, uh, uh, you know, was one aspect of, of American culture, Yankee ingenuity, uh, and that we would be the people who would attempt something like this. 
and, and do it. And, yeah. and there's a lot of other things correct about that book. They launched from Florida, okay, it, in a capsule with a crew of three. They orbited the moon and landed in the Pacific Ocean and were picked up by a United States Navy warship, all as actually happened. Okay, the, the uh, of course, what he got incorrect was he used heavy artillery for propulsion. But the, um, you know, but you said 19th century mind grappling with a 20th century problem. Uh, you know, we have the analogous problem that, you know, I have ideas on how we're going to terraform Mars. And I think Mars is going to be terraformed, but it'll probably be terraformed by ways considerably more sophisticated than anything I can propose. Um, because I'm a 20th century mind grappling with a 22nd century problem. Hmm. So to Jules Verne had a bit of a knack for prophecy. If you, in 1969, were going to prophesy that by 2020, we still weren't going to be on Mars. <laughs> I mean, you know... It, I would have thought it, they were crazy. Um, the, no, I mean, exactly. You know, I'm 17 years old. I'm watching the moon landing. If anybody had told me then that I'd be 68 and we wouldn't have you know, cities on the moon and Mars, I would have thought they were crazy. But, you know, so it's been 50 years, but right now, something is actually happening. You know, in the, in the past decade or so, something is really happening. And uh, so the question is, why? I mean, is, is it uh, for technology, has technolo technology moved along uh, to a sufficient uh, place? Or did we need uh, Musk and Bezos? Why now? Well, the, clearly the thing that has broken loose now uh, over the past t 10 years has been the entrepreneurial space launch revolution, which has been spearheaded by Musk, but which is also having ramifications that go beyond Musk and SpaceX, and in fact go beyond space flight. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, see, here's the situation. Um, it's not that government programs can't innovate. They can. Uh, but they really have to be focused in, in, in their objectives. Um, you know, 1957 to 1969, we went from Sputnik to landing people on the moon. And in the process, we developed pretty much the whole bag of tricks needed to do space stuff. You know, hydrogen oxygen engines, multi-stage heavy lift launch vehicles, in space life support, in space navigation, communication, soft landing techniques, re-entry techniques, radio isotope generator, I mean solar power, the whole thing, it was all developed. And the cost of space launch dropped from, you know, millions of dollars a kilogram to $10,000 a kilogram. But then it stayed there for the next 40 years. And um, qualitatively, you know, well, I mean, we did some new missions. Okay, we landed Viking on Mars, but Viking was already designed or begun to be designed in this period before 69. Certainly Mariner 9, which orbited Mars, was in fact developed before 69. In other words, these things, the unmanned probes, Pioneer Jupiter, was all developed in this period of time. That is the, the craft, okay? and but the cost of space launch, which had dropped precipitously during this period, um, stayed flat for the next 40 years. Um, and while you had uh, this craft that had been developed was exercised in increasingly sophisticated ways with Pioneer, Jupiter, Voyager, Viking, and so forth, um, the, the okay, spirit and opportunity, um, that the basic story held the same because the, the human spaceflight program went from being a purpose-driven program to being a vendor-driven program. Mm -hmm. um, it, it no longer had this very clear drive. We're going to put people on the moon. And um, so this countered entropy. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but without that, the main thing about the human spaceflight program was, oh, here's the government wants to spend a lot of money. Uh, well, I have an idea how they could spend it. They can spend it on me. The uh, and the the uh, and and that's what the program became about. So, for instance, the objective of the shuttle program, for the most part, was flying shuttles. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, in other the objective of the of the moon program was not to fly Saturn V. It was to get people to the moon.
So right. is, there, is, it, it, is there any technical problem with the idea of a space plane or is that something that could work? Why, why did that the fail? Shuttle? Well, yeah. Well, the shuttle was designed upside down because the, the most important thing to reuse about a launch vehicle is the lower stage, not the upper stage. The, the shuttle um, attempted to reuse the upper stage. So the shuttle had the same takeoff thrust as the Saturn V, but one-seventh the payload delivery, because most of what it was delivering to orbit was the shuttle itself, not the payload the shuttle was carrying. I see. Um, I see. So, see, Musk got it right with the Falcons, which is reuse the first stage. Mm -hmm. The first, I mean, look, you take um, a Falcon 9, it's got nine engines in the first stage, one in the second stage. So they're recovering the first stage. It's much more important to recover it. And... It's easier to recover it because it doesn't go to as high a, a, mm -hmm. a, a velocity or as high an altitude. And um, and also the extra weight required to recover it has less impact on the payload mass. To, if you add weight to the upper stage, if you add a kilogram to the upper stage, you take one kilogram away from the payload. If you add mm -hmm. uh, a kilogram to the lower stage, you take about a tenth of a kilogram away from the payload. Because you jettison at some point. Well, it's just because you're not taking the extra weight as far in either in space or in velocity space, if you will. Um, so shuttle was 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 misdesigned. The correct way to design a reusable launch vehicle, the top priorities were using the lower stage. OK, mm -hmm. you know, if you wanted to make a reusable Saturn V, you would should want to reuse the, the, the S1 stage. Uh, you know, and 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 not 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 the upper stages. So so, what about from a technical point of view? Could did we need to see uh, processing power developed to a certain point before we could do self landing rockets, or did we could we have done that thirty years ago, twenty years ago? I think we could have done it then. Absolutely, could have done it then. Uh, and in fact, there were designs uh, at that time. The Boeing designed something called the F one uh, flyback where that was not going to be a vertical landing. It would, it would extend wings and land the first stage. Um, once again, the extra weight of those wings on the first stage is only a minor uh, hit on the payload. Um, so they would recover the first stage, which is first stage of the Saturn V had five times the thrust of the second stage um, and, and 25 times the thrust of the third stage. So you'd want to reuse... so. Now, so here's Musk. Okay, so Falcon 9, nine engines the first stage, one in the second stage. Falcon Heavy, 27 engines in the first stage and one in the upper stage. So obviously much more important. Now, now he's trying something with Starship and um, he's going to have both the first and the second stage reusable. Now, and then he even proposes to reuse the second stage by refueling it in space to have it go further. Now, there are inefficiencies in that, uh, but what his point of view is, is that if he can make a single workhorse, the, even though this is not the most efficient way to do it from a rocketry point of view, it could be the most efficient way to do it from an economic point of view. Because then you can mass produce. Well, you can mass produce it. And if he can refuel those second stages on orbit and they go further, he doesn't need a specialized spacecraft. Okay. Now, I, I actually question this. I, I think he, he needs to have uh, a mini starship, which is what goes to Mars instead of refueling the whole giant starship. Because you want to go to Mars and then refuel and come home. Uh, is, to take, is Falcon Heavy too small uh, for that? Or well, uh, no. In fact, the mini Starship that um, I prescribe would be essentially like Starship, but sized uh, to be the upper stage of a Falcon Nine. Uh, and uh, so, the Falcon Nine combined with the mini Starship would represent a fully reusable medium lift launch vehicle. But the mini Starship in the payload bay of Starship would be able to fly from Earth orbit to Mars. And when you refuel it to come back to Earth, it only needs like one-tenth the propellant that a Starship would need, which means if you're making your return propellant on Mars, which Musk is going to do, it's the only way to do that mission architecture, um, 
and it's my preferred mission architecture, direct to the surface direct return using locally produced propellant. Uh, but still, even though the mass is there, the power to produce, turn CO2 and water into methane and oxygen goes linearly with the amount of methane and oxygen you're making. And, um, you know, and the size of, of the production facilities and, and just the whole operation. Um, so that is why, so, but here's the thing. Um, so Musk and I disagree on this point. Um, but I actually agree with his philosophy that underlies his disagreement with me, which is his philosophy is show me why I need it. Mm. Okay. And I think he does need it, but he thinks that uh, my argument is, is not compelling. The, 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 but this is very different from the NASA attitude, which is show me why I might not someday need it. Uh, the, the, in other words, they're building a lunar orbiting space station and you say, well, you know, um, we did go to the moon without a lunar orbiting space station. So if you really want to go to the moon, why are you building a lunar orbiting space station? And their argument is, well, you know, it might come in handy. Uh, and the, uh, and if you, if you have this attitude of wanting to develop everything that might come in handy, if someday you actually had a purpose in mind, um, you never get there. Okay. I suppose There's an NASA infinite number and of things that might come in handy. I, I suppose SpaceX and NASA are working under completely different uh, external constraints, though, since you know NASA is a government-run uh, institution. Yeah, but but it, but, but, but but here's the thing. Well, it's certainly true that they're under different constraints, but uh, I, I nevertheless have to be critical uh, of of NASA on this. I mean, look, the NASA. Science Directorate, which includes both the, the robotic planetary missions and the space astronomy program, uh, remains a purpose-driven program. They did not land rovers on Mars in order to give business to the big airbag consortium. Okay, the, 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 you know, the mission was to land rovers on Mars, and then they figured out what they needed, and that's what they used. Okay, the, the, the human spaceflight program, on the other hand, has become not purpose driven but vendor driven that is without a compelling mission since the end of apollo okay as i say it's mostly been about the money and then you get these constituency driven things where uh, a, a group has contracts for something and basically it becomes you can't do your program until you do our program um and but so the question is then if if we had a mission and now we have SLS coming online and we have uh, Starship. Where can we go with these? What, what can we oh, do? Oh, well, with them? both of those represent very powerful capabilities. Um, I mean, uh, no, the SLS is way overpriced and way overdue, way, way overdue. Uh, I was actually a member of the team that did the preliminary design of what is now called SLS in 1988. Uh, okay. And it should have been flying by 1994. Uh, in fact, the whole point of the design was to use... This shuttle. is the original Ares, right? Yes. Right. And before that, it was known as Shuttle Z. And the, um, but the idea was, here's, we have all this shuttle stuff, solids, SSMEs. How do we make a booster out of this? And we figured out how you can make a booster out of shuttle stuff. And the idea was not that it was supposed to be the most advanced thinking, but it was the fastest way to put something together with a set of tinker toys that you currently had on the shelf. And the 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 and they they've made a meal of it for sure. Uh, but the and the whole idea was to have a, a heavy lift booster with more or less Saturn V capabilities. Now it was supposed to have a much more powerful upper stage. Um, we looked at uh, both uh, uh, a J2, which has got 250,000 pounds of thrust for the upper stage, or the SSME itself, which is 500,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, NASA, for a while, did go with the J2, but unbelievably, they were unable to redevelop it. So okay? what, what do these that numbers is, mean for someone? This is an engine that was developed in the 1960s to 
power the upper stages of the Saturn V. It went out of production. NASA in the, 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 the 2000s was unable to recreate it. But but so what for for people who aren't familiar um, with the uh, engineering side of things, what what does that uh, power mean? Where where can you get to with with those rockets? Well, can, can the, you... you can get to the moon or Mars. Uh the um, okay, but anyway, the the upper stage of the Saturn V, the, the, not, not just the second stage, but even the third stage with two hundred fifty thousand pounds of thrust, was able to light its engine short of low Earth orbit. So that engine not uh, actually helped get them to orbit and then to the moon. Uh, but instead, since they were unable to redevelop the J-2, which is incredible, uh, they put on a, a group of much smaller engines um, and the upper stage with a bunch of these engines has like 90,000 pounds of thrust instead of 250 or 500. And um, it's just inadequate. And this is undercutting the performance of SLS. But the the other problem, of course, with SLS is expense. And it, it's incredible to me. They say they can only launch one a year. SLS is less complex than shuttle. Okay, because it's basically a shuttle without the orbiter. And, you know, we launch as many as eight shuttles a year. And even when the program was in its declining years, four a year. And the the SLS, one a year. And that's, by the way, what makes it so expensive. Because it's not the parts, it's the people. It's the payroll mm. of an army of people. And if you are, 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 are maintaining this army costs you $2 billion a year, then and you launch one, the launch is going to cost two billion dollars. If you launch two, they'll cost one billion each. If you launch four, it'll be half a billion. Each. What What is SpaceX's annual running costs? I don't know. Um, the um, I used to know actually. Um, because they they run on a budget that's significantly smaller than uh, the NASA's, NASA's total oh, yeah. budget. <laughs> sure. I mean, NASA's got twenty two billion or something like this. Yeah, NASA's got twenty two billion. Um, well, why don't you do the, if SpaceX has got 10,000 employees, perhaps, um, and uh, so the payroll there is about 1 billion a year. Uh, if you assume it costs a hundred thousand dollars per employee on average, uh, times 10,000 is $1 billion. Uh, then they probably have another billion dollars in all sorts of other costs, materials, facilities, and so on. So their annual budget is probably a couple of billion a year, about one tenth of NASA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But okay, so so uh, on on a very small budget, it seems that uh, so you're an advocate for Starship then, as opposed to SLS. It sounds like. Well, okay, here's the deal. Okay, I am not in the crowd that says let's cancel SLS. Um, I, I don't think it's necessary. Until Starship materializes, if SLS is there, I'd be happy to use it. Um, once Starship is operational, and if it has anything like the performance of uh, that the, the Musk is claiming for it, then SLS will be unnecessary uh, and, and just an added cost, and I think it will cancel itself. Um, the, it will just be irrational to keep using it, but, um, I, you know, there are people who think, well, we should cancel SLS because, um, it's NASA's excuse not to fund Starship or something. Uh, Starship doesn't need NASA funding. Um, and I think it's actually moving a lot faster without NASA funding. Uh, because then you don't have NASA people telling you uh, when it's safe to test it or fly it or this or that. I mean, the whole methodology of, of SpaceX is what well, you can see. It, it, it's it's quick and dirty. It's build it, fly they it. blow up a lot of Build rockets. it, fly it, crash it, learn from the mistake, build it again, fly it again, get it right. Uh, you know, here, here's SLS. This program has been in being since 1988 and it is yet to fly 
Uh, Starship program uh, arguably has been in being since 2016 and um, they've already test flown the Starhopper and two flights of the prototype Starship. Of course, uh, the thing flew to stratosphere, came down, crashed on landing, but they now have flight data of the whole envelope. They they know what went right and what went wrong at every stage of the flight. And, you know, the next one probably will succeed or it might not. You know, Musk failed on the landing of Falcon 9 five times before they succeeded. Five times. Okay. NASA does not have that kind of, 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 of uh, uh, stomach for failure. But that slows them down tremendously. Um and you know, you know, if the Wright brothers had waited in t to fly before they knew it was going to be safe for them to fly, they never would have flown. Hmm. So let's assume that uh, everything goes right, and we and we have Starship flying within the next few years. Uh, what, what does your blueprint look like uh, in sort of a broad brush uh, picture? Well, here's the thing. You know, it's like. World War II buffs, you know, will say, some of them will say the Normandy landing was the right place to land. Eisenhower got it right. Others will say, no, they should have landed in Calais. They should have landed in Brittany. How about Holland? Why not Denmark? You know, there's all these strategists. And, but it was done in Normandy and it did produce the victory. Now, I can have somewhat different ideas than Musk about how one can do it, but um, you know, Musk has decided to land in Normandy, and the war is going to be won or lost in Normandy, um, and that's how it is. So it's going to be Starship, probably without the mini Starship, uh, unless they find out that, for instance, orbital refueling is much harder than uh, they think it's going to be, for example. Uh, that hasn't been done yet. No, right? it hasn't been done. They have ideas on how they could do it, and the ideas look uh, like they might work, uh, but it hasn't been done yet. No one's done it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But, or or Musk might do a lot of math and decide that sending a big starship all the way to from Earth to Mars and back keeps it out of action for three years, uh, when if he just uses it to lift a mini starship to orbit and send that to Mars, he can get the starship back on Earth the next day and reuse it the next week, that that might make more sense. So unless he changes his mind, the, the Mars plan is his plan, okay? The war is going to be won or lost in Normandy. And, 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 and so so what does that blueprint look well, like? Well, what it looks like is this. Okay, now, first of all, um, I think one thing that Musk can't make happen is the schedule happen according to his fondest wishes. And so I, I think that the um, uh, it's going to take longer than he, he currently projects. Okay. In other words, uh, you know, in, in what was it, um, late 2019, he had his uh, debut of the Boca Chica uh, facility, was, uh, and at there he claimed that Starship would be reaching orbit within six months, which would be April 2020, and it still hasn't reached orbit, and in fact, the the lower stage vehicle, the super heavy, which is required to make it reach orbit, hasn't even been built. And at that time, I said, I'll give them two years to reach orbit. Um, and that even that might be optimistic that he'll reach orbit next year. But I do think he'll probably reach orbit during 20, if not in 2021, 2022. And certainly. So the, 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 the craft that we just saw explode, that's the upper section. Yes, it is. Okay, and so then, then after that's finished, he has to. Uh, He's got to build a lower uh, one, which is uh, much bigger. Uh, the so-called super heavy, the the lower stage of the mm -hmm. starship, has got like thirty-one engines on it. Uh, the upper mm -hmm. stage only has um, seven, um, and in fact, the test vehicle that was just flown had three. Um, mm -hmm. The the so he's got a ways to go there, but but here's the point. It doesn't matter that he didn't reach orbit in 2020. The progress he's made has been quite impressive on its own terms. Um, 
And whether he reaches orbit in 2021 or 2022 or 2023 in the bigger picture doesn't matter much. I certainly think that starships will be flying uh, regularly to Earth orbit by 2024. And um, and if that's the case, um, I mean, somebody's going to be elected president in 2024. And he or she are going to look at their advisors. And if this is the, the reality of the world, that the starships are flying up and down to orbit, 100 tons to orbit each flight, okay, you know, uh, at a cost 1% that of the Saturn V. Um, you're going to ask, can we send humans to Mars? Well, yeah. Could, I mean, by the end of my second term, yes. Um, is it going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars? No, it could probably be done within NASA's existing budget. He's already uh, developed the, the primary transportation system. There needs to be a lot of odds and ends developed, uh, and some of which uh, we're better suited to develop than him, for instance, uh, surface nuclear power reactors, um, which require access to controlled materials. Um, and so forth. But if we meet this guy halfway, yeah, we can have people on Mars before the end of your second term. And I think that's... What, what, what would they be using the power, the nuclear power uh, for? Well, like for the, example, the payloads in this case? Uh, to make the propellant for the return. I see. How, how many ships would you need to set up a colony? Well, it depends on... I mean, if, if we're going to be... The, the reason I'm asking is if we're going to be shooting nuclear payloads into space and we have to do that a thousand times. Oh, you don't have to do that a thousand is, times. You, the, probably one starship could take the nuclear power plant that you need. Um, mm -hmm. The the, and you know you land two or th three of these things on the ground. You know, they each have enough accommodations. I mean, you land one thing I like. I don't like starship very much as an ascent vehicle to come back from Mars because it's so big. It's it's way oversized, but. As a landing vehicle going one way and leaving it there, uh, in addition to the fact that it can bring down a very large cargo, it itself, you're landing an apartment building on Mars, you're landing housing for 100 people. Okay, boom. Okay, there it is. Uh, so you, you land, you know, three starships on Mars, you've got yourself a very substantial base. Uh, I just prefer having a smaller vehicle for the Earth return segment because I don't have to make propellant for such a large uh, 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 craft. Um, mm -hmm. So, but as going one way to Mars and landing it there with a big payload starship is, 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 is what's not to like. And the, um, um, so, yes, uh, I think what would happen is um, once you, okay, the first step is developing starship capability to go to orbit. Second step is developing the capability to refuel them on orbit so they can go beyond low Earth orbit. If you can't do that, you can still use them just as a fully reusable heavy lift launch vehicle and proceed with the rest of the mission in a more conventional fashion, for example, with a plan like the Mars Direct plan that I first laid out in 1990. Mm -hmm. And this is my book, The Case for Mars, the, 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 where you use a heavy lift vehicle to get things to orbit and then the spacecrafts go further from there. Okay, state. So instead of doing staging, Musk is doing refueling. Um, now, so you do the refueling. If you can do the refueling, then the starships can fly all the way to Mars. Um, and you don't need a specialized lander or aerobrake or anything. The starships got it all. Um, so um, you land, say, three starships on Mars. Okay. Um, including delivering a very heavy power system and um, by heavy, I mean a powerful power system. I mean, you could bring seven football fields of solar panels if you like, uh, mm -hmm. but it's less reliable power on Mars because of the dust storms. You really, mm -hmm. uh, it'd be preferable to have a nuke um, or several nukes. Uh, and the... Um, And then you've got housing and you've got machinery for making propellant. You land, you know, a battalion of robots on, on Mars. Some of them are exploration robots, like fanning out, doing science and prospecting. Others of them are construction robots 
or work robots that, I mean, if you do bring solar panels, they're deploying these fields of solar panels, and plugging them up that, you know, or they could be mining ice. Uh, you know, we've now using ground penetrating radar have detected uh, nearly pure water ice glaciers as far south on Mars as 38 degrees north, which is the latitude of Athens on Earth or San Francisco. Um, the uh, So if you have your base near one of those, you could be mining water. And you basically set up the propellant making apparatus. And in fact, the starships that you've landed, their propellant tanks could be your uh, tank farm. You could use those once they've landed as your storage tanks. So you make lots of propellant on Mars. Um, and, and so before you send your people, you've got a gas station built on Mars. And, and, and this is the key thing, okay? Um, in Mars Direct, I sent an Earth return vehicle with a rather small propellant making plant built into its landing stage that would just pump the propellant right up into it. The, here, you're, you're basically landing a whole base in advance and you set up a significant operation to produce propellant on a large scale. Uh, Musk's argument for using Starship as a return vehicle is well, it's okay to use it as a return vehicle because it can deliver so much payload that I can set up propellant making on the scale required to refuel a starship. I still think it'd be better to have a large payload delivery capability but have uh, a smaller propellant requirement for the return. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This is how it's going to be. We're landing in Normandy and that's where the war is going to be won. Okay. Um, and, you know, uh, Brittany might have been a better idea, but that's not where we're leaning. And the the um, so so now you've got a, a pre-established base on Mars. You've got housing. You've got propellant making. You've got propellant. They may be in a set of greenhouses and are are growing plants. So you've got the farm built before the people arrive. It's all there. So all they have to do is check in, bring a credit card, and the food is there, the propellant is there, uh, the house is there. Okay, the um, so that that's what you do. And doing it this way, by the way, um, will, first of all, obviously exercise the whole starship launch, refueling, interplanetary transfer, and uh, entry and descent and landing on Mars, all that stuff. You could be running the life support system in these uh, starships on Mars, under Martian conditions, even though there's no people in it. In other words, you're d retiring all sorts of risk from the program before you're sending people. And then, so you've got this whole thing there. And so now the surface of Mars is the second safest place in the solar system. Um, the, after the surface of Earth. Okay, parts of Earth. Anyway, the, um, so then you send a starship to Mars with people in it, and you're going not to, you, you know, the, the housing is there, the resources are there, um, there's, you know, 50 robots, there's three megawatts of installed power, There, you know, everything you need, it's all there. Um, and, um, and so, you know, if we have starships flying to orbit uh, in a fully operational sense by, say, 2024, um, you know, and, and if they can refuel things, the first Starship test flight to Mars could be in 2026. Um, and, uh, you know, and then several more in 2028. Yeah, land on Mars in 2030 with people. And then what's the plan for ramp up after that? Well, so the, I'm guessing the first people will be NASA astronauts, but then afterwards. Well, here's the thing. Okay. Um, There's one part of Musk's plan, as he has presented it, that I think he will eventually diverge from as he comes to understand the nature of the problem a bit better, okay? Because he's been very focused on the transportation system and hasn't been thinking about the colonization process that much, okay? We don't just, once we go there, start sending you know, a thousand starships a year to Mars and bringing in a hundred thousand people. Okay. Um, okay. 
this isn't Normandy Beach. It is different. Okay, the 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 this is Plymouth Rock. Okay, and the so the first mission. Well, okay, maybe ten people. Um, and this, with a plan to return, and and the first uh, crew may very well be uh, planning to return. And maybe the second crew is a round-trip exploration mission. But while they're there, they're not just exploring, they're building up the um, production capabilities of the system. Now you have not just robots on Mars, you've got people to help them and, 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 and organize and, and, uh, this thing. We want to be building lots of greenhouses on Mars. We want to be establishing facilities on Mars that can make steel out of Martian iron oxide. You know, the planet's red because of iron oxide, and steel is a natural to make on Mars. Are there any materials that you will always have to truck from Earth uh, to Mars, or do they have the chemistry to make more or less everything we need? The chemistry is all there. The issue is the technology to turn those materials into resources. There's there's no such thing as a natural resource anywhere. Okay, there's only natural raw materials. It is human inventiveness, technology that turns materials into resources. Land was not a resource on Earth until we invented agriculture. Okay, oil was not a resource until we invented oil drilling, refining, and machines that could run on the kind of product that it produced. Uranium wasn't a resource until we developed nuclear power. Deuterium is not a resource now, it will be once we develop fusion power. Now, Mars, okay, there's all that red iron oxide all over the surface. That'll be steel when, or it'll be a resource for making steel when we have the entire soup to nuts technology for making steel out of that under Martian conditions. Okay, mm -hmm. there's water and CO2 on Mars, but we have to create automated greenhouses uh, that can grow food using that. Um, maintaining the right temperatures, the right pressures, the right everything. Um, we may be able to take advantage of uh, ambient CO2 to have uh, higher levels of CO2 in those greenhouses than uh, is normal on Earth because... Have we done this on Earth? Have we had t test runs yes, of complete works. self? Yeah. In, in, in fact, we're doing a global experiment in this respect right now, as you may have heard. And the... Um, and in fact, as a result of uh, the CO2 addition to the Earth's atmosphere, since 1985, rates of plant growth on Earth have increased by 15%. Now, actually, um, it's a two-sided thing because the ocean has not shown a similar pickup uh, because the limiting ingredient for plant growth, phytoplankton growth in the ocean isn't CO2. It's trace elements like iron. Uh, the, if you want to take up CO2 from the atmosphere, if you're concerned about global warming, for example, uh, one very productive strategy would be to fertilize the open ocean, um, which would vastly expand fish stocks and take CO2 out of the atmosphere in that process. But in any case, on land, uh, it, it has been a very positive effect. Um, the, but to get back to the subject, uh, well, greenhouse... Uh, Farmers have, for some time, uh, many of them used CO2 enrichment um, in, in the, inside the greenhouses, and it does result in increased production. On Mars, we certainly uh, might take advantage of this uh, because you've got lots of CO2. You don't have to buy the CO2 for $300 a ton. It's right there. And the... Um, so... Uh, but in any case, we want to create um, production capability. And as you create production capability, it becomes logistically easier and easier to support larger groups of people on Mars. Okay, you know, if the, the first thing, of course, we're going to make on Mars is propellant. We'll also extract water. After propellant, water is the main consumable. Then food. Um, Water is more important than food from a mass transport capability. The, uh, you use a lot more water than the amount of food you eat. A kilogram of food a day you use a lot more water than that. Um, the, the, the 
because water is used not just for drinking but for washing and cooking and all sorts of stuff and, and even chemical processes and everything. Um, but so first propellant, then water, then food. Okay, oxygen, of course. Um, um, oxygen can be produced as a byproduct of growing food, but it also can be produced by physical chemical means separate from growing food. Um, but then when you go beyond that, you say, okay, what about materials? Okay, bricks, concretes, um, ceramics, metals, plastics, glass, okay, all this kind of stuff, and then methods for fabricating these materials into useful things. Um, now you can cast metals, but you can also 3D print them, and then you don't need uh, such a big and uh, machine shop capability. Uh, the, and uh, well, plastics are easy to 3D print, and, and then glass. See, if you can make these heavy things on Mars, relatively crude things, but necessary and involving a lot of weight, this will reduce, you know, by a couple of orders of magnitude, the amount of mass that needs to be transported to Mars to support uh, a, a person on Mars. Um, so now you're just sending, you know, things like you know, this, like iPhones to Mars. Mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, you build greenhouses on Mars. Okay, it'd be good if the bulk material, the glass or the plastic that composes the bulk of the greenhouse is made on Mars. Uh, perhaps you can even make the motors for the fans on Mars. But maybe the computers that control the motors and the fans, that stuff has to be made on Earth. But you can see... Eliminating the glass, then eliminating the motors and fans, and then finally eliminating the the you know the digital technology, but that's the lowest priority because it's the least mass, and it's mm -hmm. also the most complex, involving a, a, a very complex process to 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 make and large division of labor. So, the big massive crude things first, then the medium complexity things, and then finally the most sophisticated stuff. Um, One of the things I'm, I, I wonder about is, you know, assuming we can get the technology side of things sorted, you know, with the Apollo program, after the first uh, landing, people sort of stopped, they, they lost interest in, in the program uh, pretty quickly. And one, one thing I would worry about is, you know, you have your first landing on Mars, everyone's glued to the screen, there's a lot of excitement. Uh, but then as... Uh, excitement sort of dies down, which may happen again. What's the economic model that keeps the, you know, assuming you've got the technology side fixed, is, is there, what's the commodity that the, um, that the colony runs off? Inventions, um, um, intellectual property. Um, there are things that you could think of that you might export from Mars. Deuterium is six times as common on Mars as it is on Earth, um, so forth. But really, interplanetary uh, transport of material goods is unattractive. Interplanetary transport of uh, intellectual property, on the other hand, is no problem whatsoever. Um, and the, uh, you know, and of course the most valuable piece of intellectual property that there is, is a patent. Um, the, an invention. Now, I think that A Mars colony um, is going to be a massive engine for invention uh, because you're going to have a group of uh, uh, extremely technically adept people and extremely dedicated people, okay, um, who are in a frontier environment where they're going to be confronted with all sorts of challenges. They're going to be forced to innovate. And... Um, and also they're going to, for practical reasons, they're going to be relatively free to innovate. Um, and, and so they will. They will want ultra-productive crops for those greenhouses. And they're not going to let anybody tell them that, you know, these extra-large tomatoes you're growing could be a threat to the biosphere. You know, it's just bullshit. Okay, we're going to go with this. And, um, and then, so genetic engineering, I think, will, um, 
advance very forcefully on Mars. And these so so the the picture is the colony is sort of like an R and D wing of a of a large corporation in some sense. Well, yeah, it's an inventors colony. Mm. But you say, well, why not establish an inventors colony in uh, the Arctic? Right. Well, the Arctic or Nevada or uh, you know the California Central Coast. Okay. Well, the reason is um, the zeal of the people uh, involved. I mean, if you take three of the most remarkable uh, colonization efforts of the past 400 years, the pilgrims going to Massachusetts, the Mormons going to Utah, the Jews going to Palestine, uh, all actually very counterintuitive things. Uh, the uh, now there was there's some number of things they all had in common. Number one, the motive was not commercial; it was transcendent. Um, two, um, they all had strong home front organizations supporting it based on the belief that it was important. Okay, uh, and who would pay the transport of the actual colonists. Um, and, uh, and this is actually still true with uh, Israel to this day, actually. Um, the, uh, but they also had people with, you might say, a lot of steel in their backs because they had this transcendent purpose. Um, mm -hmm. And um, they all produced very remarkable results. Uh, the, 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 and, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, a Mars colony, you know, in other words, you take people, you recruit people who want to go to Mars. Okay. First of all, you'll have no problem recruiting people. Okay. Second of all, you'll have no problem recruiting people that include people with outstanding technical credentials. Well, you establish an inventor's colony in the California Central Coast, you'll have no problem recruiting people with uh, technical credentials too. But, you know, they get a better job offer from Xerox, goodbye. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and the, the, they're not faced with the same uh, 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 challenge. They haven't made the same commitment. They aren't as committed. Um, the, the, and so... I think the Mars colony, and then also, of course, they will not be as far away from terrestrial regulation. Um, you know, this flu vaccine, the flu, mm -hmm. COVID. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Do you know Moderna actually developed their vaccine in two days in January 2020? Mm -hmm. But the testing. That's right. Okay. And safety testing was done by July. And then all the testing since then has been to prove to the satisfaction of various regulators that it was effective on a statistical basis. See, safety testing can be done very quickly. You give the drug to a thousand people and if nobody develops bad effects, it's safe. Proving a preventive medicine like a vaccine is effective requires having a, a group of people be vaccinated and a control population and waiting a long enough time that you can get statistics that these people, that a hundred of these people should have gotten sick, but they haven't. Uh, so your argument is that you can innovate much quicker uh, in the colonies than, than you might well, yes, on Earth. Well, yes, you can. And <laughs> there's no regulatory body. Th that's right. And the, the um, so um, I, I, I think that they'll, they'll be able to innovate uh, much quicker but both in medical areas and, and, and in other areas of uh, uh, biotechnology. Uh, agricultural. In the long term, is there a chance that uh, the colony might also become a, a fuel station? I mean, it's a much smaller gravity well to lift uh, fuel up into orbit. Well, it uh, could do Mars, that, right? and, but that's later. That's when asteroid mining becomes a thing, and then you become a logistical support for that. But look, um, one thing that's characteristic of, of a frontier is a labor shortage. Um, mm -hmm. And um, this was characteristic of the American frontier. And, and 
this is why you had uh, a tremendous drive for creation of labor-saving machinery. Uh, and, well, fine. Um, and the Martians will certainly go for labor-saving machinery. But now this is the 21st century, and labor-saving machinery includes not only automated production systems, but robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, and artificial intelligence is labor saving in the sense that um, you can give individuals additional sets of skills. So it's not just expanding the volume of labor, it's, it's expanding the diversity of the skill sets that are available. Uh, and I, I think the Martians are going to take the point on this. And of course, there's going to be resistance to this on Earth because labor-saving machinery, by definition, puts people out of work in certain professions. Do you think um, they're going to call them the Martians? What else would you call someone who lives on <laughs> I'm looking forward <laughs> to that day. <laughs> yeah. I guess... Oh, just go on, sorry. Well, anyway, so innovations in genetic engineering, labor-saving machinery, robotics, artificial intelligence, and I think also possibly uh, energy. Okay, what is holding back fusion power on Earth is, well, you know, why not use a waterfall or natural gas or a solar panel or coal? Um, there's lots of ways to make energy on Earth. I see. Um, the, here you have a novel environment. Deuterium is quite plentiful, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, solar power is only 40% as strong as on Earth mm -hmm. and uh, no waterfalls until after we terraform the planet. Um, the, the, and fossil fuels, you can make them, but it requires energy to make it. It's a net loss, um, which is not to say you shouldn't do it because you want portable power, but it's not a net producer of energy. So you need to innovate just to survive. That's the baseline, essentially. Well, and to prosper. Hmm. Uh, and, and so they will. I suppose another commodity uh, outside of uh, technological advance is, you know, the States is, I mean, it, it's quite divided at the moment. And perhaps having this uh, external uh, threat or goal uh, is something that will bring people together in the States. Uh, there's also well, it, 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 this goes way beyond the United States. Okay. Um, what is the major threat facing humanity today? global warming almost certainly well a lot of people would certainly say global warming there are some people who claim it's resource exhaustion there are some who even say it's overpopulation uh but in fact none of those things were the cause of the major disasters of the 20th century major disasters of the 20th century were not caused by climate change or resource exhaustion they were caused by something else entirely which is bad ideas and in particular, one bad idea in a multitude of forms. And what that bad idea was is that there isn't enough for everyone. Mm -hmm. okay. That is the idea that caused World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, the Holland of Moor, uh, and, and, and much else besides. Uh, and if you say there isn't enough for everyone, then... The, it only becomes a question, how do we make sure that we get our part, which means stopping them from getting their part? And, you know, 1912, you know, General Friedrich von Bernhardi, a uh, chief intellectual, the German general staff, wrote his bestseller, Germany in the Next War. She said, look, you know, Eurasia, either we Germans are going to get it or the Russians are going to get it. We're going to have to fight them sooner or later. Clearly better sooner before they industrialize. And Japan's strategic thinking vis-a-vis -vis China in the 1930s, same damn thing. We're going to have to fight them sooner or later. Let's take them down now while they're weak. Okay. And, you know, I happen to know for a fact, for a fact, that there are people in the American National Security Establishment uh, who believe that war with China is inevitable um, because... There's a billion of them, and if they all have cars like Westerners do, there won't be enough oil in the world. And you can bet your bottom dollar that there are similar people to them in Beijing who look at this from the other side of the chessboard and think comparable things. And so 
if that is your mental framework, you are in a pre-war situation, and the only question is when to strike. Okay, and the the now this is a false view of reality. Okay, it's it's an entirely false view of reality. Um, the you know there are seven times as many people in the world today as there was when Malthus wrote. And yet, people are eating much better, uh, and and wasting much more. Well, they're wasting, but they're creating. Uh, you know, when you know Malthus wrote, the average person owned two shirts. Um, you know, how I don't know how many shirts I own. I'm not a particularly a clothes horse or anything, but I can I got a drawer full of shirts. I don't know how many are in it. Uh, the uh, Okay, and I think that's probably the situation with most people in developed countries today. You, they couldn't tell you how many shirts they own. Um, and the... Um, so, what is it? Okay, why have living standards gone up while the population has gone up instead of down? Why given that there are more people, is there more for everyone instead of less? Because our brains are a resource. Well, yeah, the I inventions, right? And so technology defines what is and was not a resource. And the more and technology comes from I I inventions, and the more inventors, the more inventions, and inventions are cumulative. And, you know, so in fact, uh, we are not living better despite the fact that there are more people, we are living better because there are more people. The uh, and and uh, and that also, I mean, there's also secondary things. More people means uh, production at scale and so forth, and all kinds of other secondary things. But fundamentally, I mean, look, let's say somehow Malthus had been able to dictate policy effectively, and there had been half as many people in the world in the 1800s as there actually were. Okay, well, okay, they would have used less coal, but we're not hurting for the coal that they used. Okay, but okay, you can get rid of either Thomas Pest, uh, Edison or Louis Pasteur. Take your pick, because um, you're getting rid of half the innovators. Um, the you know, so there you have it. Now, so this is a false. It is it, it is a false view um, that the human race are. Uh, a group of nations in a struggle for existence over rare, scarce resources. Okay, it is a, a false view of reality. In reality, we are uh, an admittedly somewhat disorderly family of nations in a joint project to uh, expand the human prospect. I mean, China is developing right now because of electricity and, you know, digital technology, and a host of inventions that were made in the West. Uh, the West itself, however, was able to have its renaissance and enlightenment and industrial revolution because of technologies like paper and printing that were invented in China. Inventions made anywhere, sooner or later, become used everywhere. So that that's the truth. But people don't see it because it seems intuitive that the more people, the more people are eating, the less there'll be for me. Um, and so, but going to Mars, establishing new branches of human civilization on Mars, is the tangible, the sensuous proof that it is not true that there's only so much to go around because the Earth comes with an open sky. Um, and you know, and that's and that's the truth. And I do think, by the way, that um, while you know America in general and through SpaceX in particular uh, is currently leading this, this is not going to be for long an American thing. I mean, it, it will Americans will keep doing it, but it, the Chinese are going to do this, Europeans are going to do this. Yeah, you can do this. Um, Okay, that wasn't Strelka, that was Kepler. Now, the... Uh, <laughs> my other Not, no relation. Uh, yeah. So, um, the... Uh, you know, there will be multitudes of Mars 
colonies. There will be multitudes of new branches of human civilization on Mars. And I think that I mean, there'll be some competition in this, but I think it'll be like the space race was, okay? Well, yes, you know the cosmonauts. Uh, the, 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 that is, uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I have correspondents in China who, in fact, are trying to create entrepreneurial space launch companies uh, in direct competition with SpaceX, but in fact, they are excited about all of SpaceX's accomplishments. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this is a sport so, that a lot of people can appreciate. Um, so early, earlier you said that one of the benefits uh, of uh, going to Mars in terms of innovation is that there aren't going to be regulatory bodies there uh, when you arrive. Um, but so uh, an, an obvious question then is, if there are no laws, in, are there laws in place uh, in terms of resource extraction? Is 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 it possible that some argument over resource extraction uh, or, or or something like this on Mars will kick off a conflict here on Earth? I mean, I I I, I doubt that. Um, you know, the um, I think that um, you know. The, there can be some conflicts on Mars for sure, but you know, it's a pretty big, I mean, it's got a surface area equal to all the continents of the earth put together. So there's really no reason to crowd each other uh, there, uh, you know. Except humans make the resource. And so the resource is really gonna be near where you land your ships. That's right. Humans make resources and it'll be very clear on Mars that that is the case, that such wealth as there is to be had on Mars is something that you create on Mars. Um, the, um, you know, that wealth on Mars is for makers, not for takers. Um, and, you know, th that creativity uh, is the source of wealth, not force. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, that this demonstration of the positive nature of human creativity, uh, it, it's going to be profound. Uh, in other words, it is, let me put it to you this way. Adolf Hitler once said that the belief that we could have per, plenty for all through science was a Jewish lie propagated to undermine the population's belief in the necessity for war. Okay, now, think about that. Okay, now, I don't know about the Jewish role in this in particular, other than the fact that Jews, of course, are major participants in science, but it certainly is true that the belief that we can have plenty through science, A, is true, and B, mm -hmm. does undermine people's belief in the necessity for war. In the Lebensraum or whatever the push right. was. I mean, look, okay, you're in Germany now, right? That's where you are, okay? And Germans today are living much better than they did in the Third Reich, okay? Mm -hmm. Not because Germany managed to expand its borders. It did not manage to expand its borders. It shrank. Not, that's right. <laughs> okay, they have a smaller territory and a larger population than the Third Reich, but a vastly higher standard of living. Why? Because of the advance of science and technology, which is something that has been accomplished by the entire human race. Yes, Germans have participated in that to be sure, but also have uh, a, a lot of other people, including people they are trying to exterminate. And the, 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 so this is how Germany achieved plenty, not by killing people and stealing their cows. The, the, um, by uh, participating and benefiting from a global process of innovation and expansion of, of resources. Mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the topic of uh, laws though, I, I find this, this sort of aspect quite interesting because, you know, when, when you're, when you, you know, right now we're going through COVID lockdowns and people are going a little bit batty, right? <laughs> and I can imagine the first colonists, they're gonna be, quite isolated and 
any one individual can do tremendous damage to the colony. Yes. And so I, I'm wondering, do you think these sort of uh, dynamics are going to lead to very harsh laws being implemented? I think you know, exactly the forming. opposite. Um, okay. I think that the fact that individuals can do tremendous damage means you got to treat them right. Uh, mm. The, in, in fact, historically, you know, the easiest people for tyrants to oppress are nominally self-sufficient peasants because mm -hmm. no one of them is essential. You mm -hmm. kill half the village, the other half is entirely functional. Um, okay, whereas in a complicated social organism, a society, uh, a city, um, individuals are more important. Uh, I guess they're, they're also the engines of innovation, which is where you make your they're money. They're the engines of innovations, and also they can create more damage than sabotage it, it, the, 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 in a way that, that a, a self-sufficient peasant simply can't. And the, the, uh, so they got to be treated better. Also, it is the case that if you want people to come to your Mars colony, you have to have a place that people are going to want to go to which means you're not going to have a tyranny. From a Darwinian point of view, uh, a tyrannical Mars colony is impossible or, or impossible for long. They will go extinct because people won't go there. Okay, The people will go to the, 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 the place where they have the most chance to, to have a, a good life, and, and that means freedom. Um, so, you know, I mean, really, uh, you know, why did so many more European immigrants come to the United States than to, you know, various uh, Latin American colonies that were actually set up sooner? Um, mm. They did not offer the prospect of liberty, even though they, they were, you know, there, there were Spanish cities in, 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 in Mexico, I'm not just talking about the Aztec city. I'm doing actual Spanish cities that were there in before the Pilgrims landed. Um, but these were not attractive places for immigrants, and and they did not develop uh, in, in the same kind of way. Uh, but it certainly, would be interesting uh, to see if we have entirely new political systems starting in well, these new colonies. There will be new and old. The, see, I I don't think Mars is going to be utopia. I think it's going to be a laboratory. Um, I think it's going to be a place for a lot of noble experiments. There'll be lots of different colonies on Mars, and some may attempt to be tyrannies, and those ones will decline Shrivel. and disappear. Uh, the, 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 there'll be people with all sorts of new ideas on how human social relations should be organized, and uh, some of those ideas will be bad, and those colonies will, will die out. But some will be good and they will prosper and attract immigrants and become examples, not only to other Mars colonies, but to Earth. You know, mm -hmm. the, the founders of the United States called the United States a noble experiment. And now it wasn't original ideas. The ideas of 18th century liberalism that they uh, picked up on had been thought of previously in, in, in Europe. But the people who believed in them were generally regarded as pleasantly insane. The 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 the, the uh, but here they they gave them a spin, and it worked. I mean, it worked not perfectly, but it worked well enough that millions of people voted with their feet to come here, and they built this incredible nation, which even became eventually a superpower, and and became an example, so that. Democracy, and by democracy, I mean liberal democracy with individual rights and all of that, not just majority rule, um, is now considered the norm for a civilized nation, not an eccentric point of view at all. So in terms of people voting with their feet, what's the realistic timeline uh, for colonization? I mean, if, if you could lay out uh, in the next well, 200 years. Well, as I years, think, well, I think we'll have the first human landing on Mars circa 2030. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we'll have a rather substantial and vibrant Mars base there by 2040. 
okay, you know, or it's something comparable to McMurdo sounds, maybe, you know, hundreds of people on Mars. Um, the and a few children being born on Mars, uh, because people are people, and um, relationships will form, and um, you know, you'll you'll have people that will decide not to come back, and uh, of course. And, and so you'll start start developing that, and and then I also think by 2040 there won't just be the one, you know, SpaceX Mars colony. By then, you know, there'll be three or four. There'll be a Blue Origin one as well. I don't know about Blue Origin. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I bet first on a Chinese. They, they've company. got the they've got the new Glenn. <clears throat> You know, genius is a word that people frequently apply to Elon Musk. Wisdom is not, okay? Um, but there is one sense in which Musk is very wise in a way that uh, Jeff Bezos is absolutely not, okay? Is it Musk understands that he's not going to live forever, um, you know, which... A lot of people don't understand, especially someone as young as Musk. Uh, I mean, they know it abstractly, but they don't really know. It. Uh, the uh, you know, and the uh, so the Bezos has not approached this problem with the required sense of urgency, um, and it shows uh, in terms of the results. Uh, and uh, I, I have to say, I, I'd love there to be a genuine space race between Blue Origin and um, SpaceX. Um, but I think the people who are actually going to give SpaceX some serious competition are going to be the Chinese, not Jeff Bezos. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, because yeah. Um, and so, what are the chances that I will get to Mars <laughs> uh, in my lifetime? Let, well, let's if, let's say I live if, another fifty years. If you live another fifty years, and you you are a scientist, right? You work in some mm. um, physics. Yeah, there you go. That's a science, sort of. Uh, <laughs> you probably have physics textbooks right behind you in that bookcase there. Well, uh, maybe I have engineering texts. Uh, I do have some physics books around here somewhere. Uh, the um, um, but um, I think uh, you've got a good chance uh, because I think that, you know, in other words, once you have a McMurdo sound kind of situation on Mars where you have a substantial base um, and also the transport cost of going to Mars and back is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you know, then that's the kind of money that somebody working in a scientific field that has a reason to go to Mars can probably get funded to do it. Um, just like people who want to go, you know, to New Zealand to launch balloons. Uh, or if this podcast goes really well. <laughs> or if this podcast goes really well, exactly. Um, but, um, no, I mean, I, in addition to colonists, I think professionals of various kinds will be going to Mars in, in the 2040s. Uh, and the, um, so on now, but get back to, I guess I drifted a bit, you know, Musk's, if you hear his talk, he talks about colonizing Mars as kind of a D-Day invasion bringing in a hundred thousand people every opportunity and which every two years or so and then you get a million people in 20 years uh, I don't think it's going to work that way I think the way it's going to work is more organically in other words you start with a, a spearhead of people they create a, well first you have robots then you have people creating basic production facilities of different kinds uh, that creates the basis to have a larger group of people which accelerates the growth of, of productive capabilities on Mars. 
uh, infrastructure, if you will. Um, and then it grows from there. Um, it, it, in other words, Mars becomes a place that first can support, you know, an additional dozen immigrants every two years, then an additional 50, then an additional 100, then an additional 500, then an additional 1,000, and so forth. But, you know, um, it's a very interesting book. I don't know if there's a book like this for Australia, but there's a book called Voyages to the West by a historian, a very good historian named Bernard Balin. And, and it's about who went to America during the British colonial period. And in particular, in towards the end, in the mid-1700s, when the British were keeping excellent records of every person who went to America. They actually had, had uh, data kept by the authorities. They knew the names, the professions of every person who went, who left Bristol or somewhere and, and, and went to America. And the interesting thing is, is the average immigration rate to the United States during the colonial period was um, about a thousand people a year. Uh, and uh, towards this end, got to be towards the end, like 2000. But it wasn't hundreds of thousands. Okay. Mm -hmm. And between 1620 and 1770s, that's 150 years, uh, the population rose primarily through multiplication once they were there uh, to eventually 4 million people by the time of the American Revolution. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so it's interesting. I, I, I don't know what the actual immigration rates to Australia were in the uh, 1800s, but I I doubt very much it was anything like 100,000 people a year. Um, um, and um, I also have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> right. But anyway, it's a very interesting book about the process of, of colonization and who went and so forth and all that. Hmm. Um, but anyway, so I think it'll grow organically. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think we're going to see a million people on Mars in you know, the year 2050. I think we might see a million people on Mars by the year 2100, uh, but it, it won't come in with this invasion thing. It'll come uh, with this kind of wedge that it, it expands its own basis for expansion. So then uh, let's imagine everything goes to plan uh, and in 500 years time, the dream scenario unfolds. W what is it? Uh, are we going to also be spreading out to Venus? Uh, are we going to be mining Mercury? Well, in 500 years' time is what I think we're going to have. First of all, there will be new nations on Mars. Okay. There will be, you know, a billion people on Mars. I don't know. Something more than 100 million people for sure. Um, but in any case, nations, not just outposts. There will be outposts uh, and perhaps uh, city-states among the asteroids. Um, but I also, and outposts in the outer solar system, um, but I think we'll be going interstellar. Um, mm -hmm. I think that um, there will be um, human cities on hundreds of planets outside of our solar system. Um, new branches of human civilization in hundreds of solar systems in this neighborhood of, of the galaxy. Um, you know, um, we've become, we, we past 50,000 years, we have transformed ourselves from a local species in the Kenyan Rift Valley to a global civilization. Uh, not just a global species, but a global civilization. Uh, and that civilization is, is now going to be capable of giving birth to an interplanetary civilization. And an interplanetary civilization is going to be able to give birth to an interstellar civilization. I think, you know, fusion power... I'm very keen on fusion power um, because, you see, it's not just another way to light light bulbs. It is that, and it could be quite attractive for that application, but it's something else entirely. Um, 
just like electricity is not just another way to heat houses okay yes you can heat houses electrically you certainly can light them electrically uh, although you could do those things with combustion as well uh, electricity is a new kind of energy compared to combustion it allows you to do new kinds of things okay nuclear power is a new kind of you know with s nuclear power you can send a submarine around the world without surfacing uh, you can't do that with a diesel electric submarine you can generate power with a diesel engine but you can't generate it underwater uh, for long um, the, 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 the fusion is a new kind of energy uh, and yes you can use it to light light bulbs um, just like light bulbs can be used to light a room that previously required candles okay but the you can also use it to propel spacecraft and a fusion rocket could have an exhaust velocity up to about seven percent the speed of light and the with proper engineering you can get a rocket to about uh, achieve a velocity of about twice its exhaust velocity um, that is for example you know our exhaust velocity of, of our hydrogen oxygen rockets is about four kilometers a second orbital velocity is eight kilometers a second okay the 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 so we're talking about a, a source of power that could uh, get spacecrafts up to an order of 10 percent the speed of light and um, that means Alpha Centauri in 40 years. Uh, so your bet is on a fusion powered craft rather than Starshot or one of these alternatives? Well, the uh, a laser pushed light sail kind of thing um, mm -hmm. is possible, um, but you still want propulsion that is relevant to these kinds of speeds. Um, and to slow down on the other side, for example. Yeah, for example. Um, the uh, although there are concepts I'm responsible for one of them the magnetic sail which creates drag against the plasma medium to allow you to decelerate without propellant or at least do much of the deceleration without propellant um, mm -hmm. the um, but yeah no I, I, I think fusion rockets are going to make possible all sorts of things including interstellar civilization and the um, and I think it's an interplanetary society which is going to want to um, develop fusion um, the, uh, and which will develop fusion. Uh, now, by the way, there's another aspect to this, um, which is, you know, okay, the Musk, in addition to developing a, a variety of very attractive spaceflight systems, uh, has proven a larger point, which is that it's possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things uh, in one-third the time at one-tenth the cost that were previously thought normative uh, for large uh, government-led organizations, um, and even do things that they had considered essentially impossible altogether, like in his case, reusable launch vehicles that come down and land at the launch site. Uh, this has not only caused a bunch of people to try to start their own SpaceXs in space, it's caused them to want to launch their own SpaceXs in other fields, including, for instance, fusion energy. That is, investors have looked at the fusion program, and for a long time, uh, people have viewed this as kind of like space launch. Yeah, you will have cheap space launch sometime soon. Yeah, right. Uh, the 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 yeah, we'll have fusion power sometime soon. Yeah, I've heard that before, right? So the 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 but then they said, well, look, maybe the problem with the fusion program was really the same problem as a uh, cheap space launch. That is, the problem wasn't fundamentally technical; it was institutional. Okay, and mm -hmm. it was the wrong kind of organization pursuing it. So now, you know, I, I recently wrote a book called The Case for Space. It's my most recent book, and in it, there's a chapter on the entrepreneurial fusion revolution. There's about seven fusion power startups that have gotten very substantial funding. I'm talking about $500 million for uh, Tri Alpha Energy in, in California, and, and there's a tokamak energy company in England, and they're, uh, 
there's about seven of them that are, are gotten some very serious money. And these people are not on, you know, a 30 year schedule like Eider. Okay. Th these people are on five year schedules. Um, and, um, you know, I actually did some work in fusion in the eighties and, uh, I was at Los Alamos and I can remember one group lunch where the group leader, you know, turned to everybody and kind of mused philosophically and said, you know, when fusion power is finally developed, it's not going to be at a place like Los Alamos or Livermore. It's going to be a couple of crackpots working in a garage. Well, I don't think, and everybody laughed because of the improbability of, of that. Okay. But while not crackpots in a garage, startups in a warehouse. Yeah. Uh, I think that's who's going to do it. Uh, so, so speaking of, uh, you know, the startup scene, have you been present during some of the uh, SpaceX launches? No, I wasn't present at a SpaceX launch. Um, I've, I've been to Boca Chica. I've been, I, I've been, and, and their factory in Hawthorne. Uh, the reason I ask is I'm, I'm wondering if you've sort of seen the environment that uh, that we're talking well, about. Well, I've certainly seen the environment in their factory, um, and I can tell you, people in their factory move a lot faster than they do in the Lockheed Martin factory, because I've been in that factory too. Uh, the and much faster than the Boeing factory. Uh, the, the, um, the lazy bee, as they call it. Um, but the, the, um, I, I certainly so what's, what's the, what's the, what like, what's the atmosphere on the ground then? Are, are the, of, of SpaceX? Do, yeah. Well, first of all, the average age is about 27. Um, mm -hmm. you walk into SpaceX and there's this giant, photograph of mars on the wall not of musk of mars, of mars. that's right <laughs> yeah okay the um i've suggested that the spacex personnel be called musketeers but it hasn't caught on um the uh but anyway you walk in there and there's this giant photo of mars in other words it's very clear to everybody why they're doing this Okay. And that's why they're there. Uh, Musk works them twice as hard and pays them less than other aerospace companies. If you want to have a, a nice, comfortable lifestyle, work for Blue Origin. First of all, it's in Seattle, which is a much nicer place than Los Angeles, let alone Hawthorne. Uh, and it's much more civilized. You work 40 hour weeks. Um, you know, SpaceX people, uh, they work all hours, they work through the weekend, they do whatever it takes. And some burn out on that, but others love it. Okay, they're living the revolution. Um, and, you know, you know, Musk says he, he looks for exceptional ability, he also looks for passion. Um, and and that's, that's what he's got. And uh, that, that's what makes the whole thing work. Nothing great's ever been accomplished without passion. So on the subject of living the revolution, if you get the opportunity to go to Mars, but it's one way, you have to stay there, would you take it? I think I would. I think I would. I like to think I would. Of course, you know, you're presented with these possibilities in the abstract and you don't have to confront it. But I like to think I would. Um, but I don't think I'm going to get that opportunity. Um, but I do have the opportunity to do things that help make it happen. Um, and I've, you know, devoted my life to that. And if I, in fact, do succeed in contributing in a significant way to helping make this happen, and it really happens, That'll be good enough for me. Escaped Sapiens.